All right, hello everybody. Um, I am going to talk a bit fast because I have a lot of information to get through, but if you uh, didn't understand anything I say, just ask me in Q&A and I'll be happy to go over it. So uh, I'm talking today about revolutionary tragedy moving forward in the aftermath of George Floyd. So um, my background, uh, I'm pretty sure all of us are familiar with the case of the murder of George Floyd and the verdict. So I'm, my background really focuses on post-verdict reconstruction within Minneapolis and kind of the state, the year after the verdict and kind of the state of Minneapolis within that period of time up to, and kind of delving a little bit up to now, but really focusing on that kind of first year after the verdict when all eyes were on Minneapolis. Um, and so kind of want to talk about the emotional impact on community trust at the time. The verdict had a profound emotional impact on Minneapolis residents, offering a sense of justice for George Floyd's death, but it also highlighted a lot of systemic issues that still needed to be addressed, as well as continued calls for accountability and citywide uh, reevaluation of policing. Uh, city, at the time, City Council pledged to dismantle the police department entirely uh, and a creation of community safety initiatives instead. And at the time, also, there were mass resignations of Minneapolis police. Um, and uh, also during the background, um, also during this time, there was an emphasis on community healing and support where efforts were made to kind of support mental and emotional well-being of the community, um, recognizing the trauma that had not only been caused but brought up through the tragic death of George Floyd. And also police department changes were kind of floated around at the time, um, emerging alternative modes of community safety. But ultimately, kind of everything fell flat. Uh, none of the things that were discussed at the time went through, and ultimately there kind of became a lack of communication over time between uh, the Minneapolis Police Department and uh, Minneapolis citizens. So that kind of led me into my research question. How can the aftermath of George Floyd be leveraged as a case study to inform strategies and initiatives aimed at fostering sustainable and mutually beneficial relationship uh, a mutually <laughs> beneficial relationship between the citizens of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Police Department with the goal of bridging existing divides and promoting uh, community-oriented <clears throat> policing. So um, with that, I had some guiding uh, questions as well as I went through my research. How have proposed and enacted policy changes within MPD affected uh, the citizens of Minneapolis post-George Floyd? What are the primary sources of conflict between citizens and the Minneapolis Police Department in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident? And what initiatives or interventions have been proposed or implemented by the Minneapolis Police Department to address citizen concerns or bridge the divide? And so here uh, I have my conflict map. It's a little busy, <laughs> but a lot was going on at the time. Um, but one thing uh, that I noticed in this kind of turbulent era was that there was a lot uh, surrounding in the periphery of uh, MPD and the Minneapolis citizens in terms of media, government, um, dynamics such as racism, uh, uh, the pandemic, um, movements, Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, um, all sorts of things. But what I really wasn't seeing was kind of a direct, a, a direct kind of relationship and communication between MPD and Minneapolis citizens themselves. It was always happening through a third party group or through the media or through someone else. It was never just kind of the community itself coming together. Um, to kind of talk about the power imbalances, influences, interdependence of one another. So um, that's kind of led to my literature review and how I wanted to address the themes. So uh, my major themes here, race, that's just kind of a part of it, uh, power as well, and intergroup conflict. And I wanted to highlight these uh, three theories that are underneath each of my themes. So under race, I have the social identity and dominance theory. And this theory poses the complex issues uh, that, that complex issues in larger or broad conflicts are essentially reduced down to a them versus us mentality. Um, kind of the nuance of it, the humanity of an issue is just kind of become mega polarized to where people just become almost tribalistic in our human nature sort of thing. Um, also, in power, I wanted to identify the system justification theory that people are motivated to varying degrees um, to defend, bolster, and justify prevailing social, economic, and political arrangements, and uh, which I felt um, 
could be seen a lot within the Minneapolis Police Department at the time in my research, and intergroup conflict, and specifically the social interdependence theory that both minority community members and police officers, um, part of the policing institution, benefit from positive outcomes for each party. If citizens feel safe and protected, then that also creates a safe working environment for police, and it kind of is a mutually beneficial uh, thing, because no, ideally, Nobody wants the police to always be on edge that will cause possibly uh, un unnecessary use of force or um, kind of uh, doing things that could lead to a wrongful death because the police are on edge. And of course the citizens don't want to deal with that either. So uh, that goes into my conflict tools. Um, I'm briefly going to cover these because I got to get through this, but uh, uh, this, uh, I first did with the conflict wheel analysis as I thought it provided a very good um, starting point, an effective starting point, uh, particularly being useful for like the multifaceted nature of this conflict, uh, encompassing cultural, historical, and sociological factors. And one thing I liked about this uh, tool as well is that it brought in dynamic considerations. So um, it facilitated a readjustment of um, my thoughts about how dynamics play into overall, uh, synthesizing the overall conflict. And it also already started uh, me thinking about options and strategies, so enabling early consideration for potential solutions. And then I also did a conflict tree, and I really like doing the conflict tree because with issues such as um, police brutality, uh, race relations, police relations, uh, or just specifically the issue between the Minneapolis Police Department and Minneapolis citizens. We are dealing with deep-seated issues that have a lot to do with the historical and social nature of the United States. So um, with that, I can look at kind of uh, the development of overlapping insights, how both groups deal with post-traumatic stress disorder, how um, there are feedback loops kind of within it, uh, between citizen safety concerns and police department support and their concern for safety, um, as well as structural causes and more dynamics that kind of allow for uh, an, oh, uh, like a dual perspective exploration of the issue. So with that, what's the strategic goal for the state of the Minneapolis community? That was kind of where I was. And it is to address the root causes of tension between MPD and citizens by establishing structured forms of communication and form accountable feedback methods on change, hopefully leading to a more harmonious and equitable Minneapolis community. So it's establishing those communications. So that's why my first intervention would be 21st century town hall meetings that uh, focuses on inclusivity and comprehensive perspectives and face-to-face -face engagement. Um, that fosters common ground and trust, that inv also involves long-term involvement and sustainable solutions. So we're kind of empowering responsibility. We're establishing agreements for results, empowers MPD to take responsibility on improving community safety and well-being, and also brings in a place where Minneapolis citizens can directly engage with the people that are supposed to protect and serve. Um, next, I also decided to intervene with the cycle of resolution. Um, that uh, has a clear and systematic process, provides a structured support in addressing conflicts and reproving relationships, and uh, prevents misunderstandings and ensures alignment throughout the resolution process through the 10 elements of results that are listed in the cycle of resolution and the attitude of resolution principles, um, because it also, again, empowers that responsibility. And finally, again, I chose community summits as it involves inclusive participa participation of relevant voices, open dialogue, and a collaborative goal-setting um, approach. Um, and uh, sorry, and a collaborative commitment and responsibility. So it fosters a sense of a shared responsibility of the community itself, and it really highlights that. Um, it isn't just a them versus us mentality, and it kind of starts to bridge that gap and open that communication to more long-standing uh, sustainable change. So speaking of that, how would I monitor and evaluate? So this would be participatory monitoring and evaluation methods. Um, so it would have facilitator involvement, so trained facilitators Trained facilitators provide ongoing observations uh, and lead to debriefing, feedback mechanisms, utilize surveys, focus groups, interviews, and cultural competence assessments um, to kind of measure the state of, um, 
it's the state of the interventions and their um, kind of success or where there are pitfalls. Uh, sustainability integration. Uh, so develop sustainability plan for consistent application over time and integrating the model into standard operating procedures and organizational culture of MPD as well as what citizens will expect from their uh, police department. And then qualitative and quantitative assessment. So using metrics for progress such as changes in key progress indicators, crime rates, community trust surveys and uh, polling as well as resource allocation and applying qualitative and qualitative methods like focus groups and interviews for deeper insight and then measuring changes in community perception regarding MPD responsiveness, transparency, and cultural sensitivity. And um, so then uh, I'm gonna, can't fully go into this, the, but um, I do wanna talk just quickly about kind of how you can see in terms of the networking, it's very separated. So there really isn't any sort of overlapping between Minneapolis citizens or the kind of uh, bureaucracy here that kind of runs uh, the police department in a sense. And it's really only the city council that kind of acts as that sort of guy or bridge. Um, so we have a sustainability challenges such as a divided network because there lacks a kind of a internal connection that could possibly hinder uh, the, abil the ability to have sustainable change. And then we have uh, homophily, both status and value homophily, so people who are aligned with their um, values and with their um, background as well. So that's the idea of the blue wall of silence or even, um, even if you support it, it's the same thing as Black Lives Matter or abolish the police or defund the police. These are also things that can apply to that. Um, but finally, how do we tackle these challenges? So first, we definitely have third-party oversight, such as the Justice Department and civil liberty advocacy groups. But the main thing would be network weaving. So it would be creating more, um, uh, sorry, creating more network weavers with social capital. So there's more brokerage. Um, be able to fill those structural holes to bridge a gap, and then uh, community bonding events um, to end off just essentially getting to know your neighbor. Uh, throughout this time, I spent a lot of time watching body cam footage, and I spent a lot of time watching interviews with uh, Minneapolis citizens and reading uh, testimonials and just kind of reading where they're coming from. And I feel at the end of the day, we often forget that the person you're seeing is human. They go through the same emotions, ups and downs that you do and worries and fears. And um, I believe through the interventions, that is the best start to start to kind of open up that dialogue and open up um, that remembrance that they are human and ultimately the goal is to make a better Minneapolis. So thank you. <laughs>